This will work better unmuted. <laughs> Welcome to our virtual public lecture this afternoon, put on by the National Conservation Training Center and the Friends of NCTC. And today we have a very special speaker, Charm Miller, is joining us, who's an environmental historian from Pomona College. And he's going to cover some of our early agency history in the late 19th, early 20th century, back in the days when we were called the Biological Survey. And this is actually a special uh, talk in our sesquicentennial year. We're celebrating 150 years as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Our agency began in 1871 with the U.S. Commission of Fish and Fisheries, and 150 years later, we're still here and putting on public lectures to help explain that history. Char has been a longtime friend, both of me and NCTC. He has spoken at NCTC uh, over the last two decades on topics ranging from uh, early conservation, conservation uh, and natural history and natural theology in Gifford Pinchot. He's the uh, author of a great biography on Gifford Pinchot. Uh, Char is currently the W.M. Keck Professor of Environmental Analysis and History at Pomona College and author most recently of Hetch Hetchy, A History of Do in Documents. He's co-editor of Theodore Roosevelt, Naturalist in the Arena, and The Nature of Hope, Grassroots Organizing, Environmental Justice, and Political Change. He has a forthcoming book called West Side Rising, How San Antonio's 1921 Flood Devastated a City and Sparked a Latino Environmental Justice Movement, and a forthcoming biography of the botanist and ecologist William L. Bray, who will probably turn up later in this talk. It's a great pleasure uh, to have Char back, at least virtually at NCTC. Uh, and thank you very much, Char, for giving us this talk. Well, thank you, Mark, in turn, and to the crew that hides behind both of us um, that has made this day possible. Uh, let me share my screen and, and uh, do I do it in Chrome or Window? There we go. All right. Um, and I'll hope that everybody can see this um, and carry on as if I could see you, which I can't. Uh, but first of all, thank you all so much for uh, giving me some time in, in your day, particularly over lunch, um, for those of you in the East Coast anyway. Uh, and it's, uh, or actually, sorry, that's my lunchtime. It's your late afternoon. Um, and I, you know, I'm really thrilled to give a, have a chance to talk about these early years because I see it as part of um, a broader process whereby the land management agencies, plural, um, emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century, Forest Service did, Park Service did, and the like. Um, and, and part of what I'm intrigued by is not just their individual histories, although that's, that's really important, but also the places where they shared that past and where there's interplay between individuals. For example, Gifford Pinchot was a good friend of C.H. Uh, Merriam, uh, the head of the biological survey. They camped together. They toured around the West at various points. There was a lot of interplay going on between the personnel, a fluidity which I find really interesting. Um, but, but if you take that collective, um, part of what we're also looking at is that any institutional history that lines up with others, or at least is emerging at the same time, partly in competition with always, I think, in relationship to there are overlapping boundaries, jurisdictions, and authorities that begin to emerge very early on. Uh, it's a welter of, of conversations that must have been taking place among all of these federal scientists in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, but that collective set of histories is also bound up with each of their relationships with the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch and with the very land and habitats and species that all of them were stewarding in slightly different ways because their missions are slightly um, differently configured. Um, but it all adds up to what I'm suggesting in the subtitle is an administrative state, a state that, a nation state that at least at one level is top down. I'm gonna argue that that's not all that's going on, um, but, but let's sort of start in a way that thinks about, if I can do this, there we go, um, some of these issues um, by using a series of maps of the major land management agencies and start obviously with your own. Um, and I want you to sort of think about 
fish and wildlife on the one hand, and also begin to overlay it with the national forests and grasslands, and overlay that with this very, now very complicated uh, National Park Service, uh, what do we call this? It's almost the diorama in its way, an astonishing uh, collection of agencies. And then the most, I don't I would say mysterious because very few people know much about what the BLM does, um, but the fact that it manages well over 300 million acres, which makes it the largest land-based uh, management agency, and because it manages the subsurface minerals that underlie forests and parks and, and refuges and elsewhere, it has, it has a dynamic play with each of these. And then if you add NOAA, the National Marine Sanctuaries, um, which totals like 500,000 acres, 500 million acres, excuse me, um, is kind of astonishing. And there are others now in play at various points in this map. But I think the larger point then is, what, how do we think about these various agencies and their authorities and jurisdictions and the way in which this plays out? I think what partly it does is these aren't just dots. These aren't um, ways by which to think of administration but there's a kind of fluidity in this play. And it struck me this morning that, that the most fluid in many respects is actually fish and wildlife if you only think administratively. Because forestry was always an ag. The Park Service has always been an interior. Bureau of Land Management came out of the, the General Land Office in interior and remains an interior. Uh, NOAA is in commerce as always had been. Um, but Fish and Wildlife actually comes to Interior from two different other agencies. Uh, the Fisheries Bureau comes out of Commerce, um, excuse me, NOAA is in Commerce, um, and um, the Biological Survey comes out of Ag, and there they form um, in, in 1940, and they form in a way that also, and I had to do this because it's a ding darling cartoon, you gotta have one in every USFS, you do, excuse me, FWS um, presentation. Um, and the real quick thing about this is the great land transfer um, that Harold Ickes, who was in the background here racing towards the, the Chicago getaway car, uh, contains a teddy bear, the forestry service misnamed, uh, holding a raggedy Ann, sorry, uh, the biological survey uh, with Roosevelt, an erect Roosevelt, um, muzzling agriculture, Secretary Wallace, uh, um, um, Ferdinand Silcox, who's the chief of the Forest Service. Um, and, you know, the transfer was a done deal. And I suspect you're sort of puzzling because you know Biological Survey went to Interior, but you also know the Forest Service did not. Um, folks who were muzzled in the Forest Service nonetheless picked up the phone called Gifford Pinchot and for the next decade, beginning in 32, 33, he just whomped on Roosevelt and Ickes and Fanley raised so much noise as the war was unfolding in Asia and Europe that Roosevelt tore up the transfer order and said, forget it, it isn't gonna happen in this, in this period and it hasn't happened since. But that's the moment at which Biological Survey headed to Interior where it would meet up with uh, the Fisheries Bureau um, and there we go. Uh, your agency as an agency, as a collective agency begins. And one of the ways we tend to tell stories about beginnings, again, in an agency sort of way, in a fairly traditional way, uh, you can track it in a lot of ways. You could parade out the leaders, um, and there are ways by which you can find out all of the leaders and what they did, including Dean Darling. You can think about the name changes that occurred in the biological survey, and I've mapped out the really the, the four ways by which this is unfolded starting with an Office of Economic uh, Ornithology, moving to a division, which was true for forestry as well, was a division in 1896. And then it became the Bureau of Biological Survey in 05, uh, which is the exact same moment when the Forest Service was created, dropping its bureau status. Um, and then the transfer um, where the two bureaus merge to become the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Or, Another traditional way of sort of thinking about this is like, what, what are the key legislative moments? As I said earlier, um, you can't think of any agency without thinking about the congressional legislation that drove its actions, its missions, its objectives, its goals, and most of all, its funding. 
Um, and so the Lacey Act in terms of migratory birds is a, is a subset of multiple legislations that begin to change the nature of the work that fish and what would become fish and wildlife would do. Pelican Island, as you know, is the first bird reservation. Now we use the language of, of um, uh, refuge. 1904, both Breton, Breton and Stump Islands emerge. Uh, Breton is photographed here. The Wichita Game Preserve, other game preserves in, and, and, and an act in 1906. Teddy Roosevelt was very, very busy. Uh, as, you, as you probably well know, in terms of national parks and national forests and also in these refuges. The one thing that Roosevelt didn't do and what Seahart Merriam couldn't get Congress to provide was with all of this growth and change in orientation, these were unfunded mandates, which is the bane of the existence of any agency, any city, in which the state says you'll do this, but we're not helping you. Uh, and it became so onerous for Merriam, who had started in 1885 as the head of the Office of Economic Ornithology. Uh, 25 years later, um, he's battered enough and angry enough with what he described as a tight-fisted Congress uh, to resign as chief of the USBS. Um, and, and the history then unfolds in a different set of directions. So that's one way or multiple ways in which one can tell it. What I want to do, though, is, is to mess a little with this construction of how one can tell the story and use Merriam and his sort of intellectual understanding of what's going on um, to give us another way to think about what the agency or what he wanted the agency to sort of focus on and, and the sort of larger project. So here's a photograph of Miriam, nice mustache. You had to have it. Pincho had a killer one at the same time. Uh, I think it was probably a prerequisite for becoming a bureau chief. Um, here's a way to think about Miriam. And he's credited with a concept that we use still, but not to the degree and the way in which he did of biogeography. It's a lovely meshing of biology on the one hand and, and geography and really geology as well. Uh, a study, he said, of the distribution of animals and plants with a, with a view to determining the boundaries of the natural life zones and their subdivisions, food habits and the like. But the purpose at some level is also and ultimately, because he was in the economic ornithology business, or so he thought, um, was to figure out what the economics what the economic benefit of this work was. And certainly that's what Congress was interested in. But I, you know, Miriam had, I think that last part was put in there because he had to do it. What he's really interested in is what he calls life zones. And the thing about his map, separate and apart from the agency maps that we looked at, paid no attention to, and rightly so, since refuges and others didn't exist in 1897 when this map um, was published. But I want us to think about the intellectual ambition of this guy. We don't think about maps in quite this way any longer, and we don't in part because of all of those refuges. What we know um, on, on forests and refuges and parks is that these places contain large numbers of different ecosystems and habitats and niches um, we can't do this broad um, um, exploration as, as he understood it, but that he had this in mind, that he was able to construct a map in this way in 1897 of these life zones, not only shaped what he wanted to do, but I think it also helps us understand that this self-taught naturalist, he was a doctor first, but was always interested in natural history, um, ultimately, through the Ornithological Union, which he helped to create, he would get posted to the federal government. Um, part of what he's trying to do in mapping out here of the life zones is also to map out a new way by which to think about land. And the way he wants us to think about it is a kind of you need a scientific expertise to think this way, you need a kind of rational understanding that you can map. He's a cartographer in his own way to make this land speak to his fellow citizens. Um, like the U.S. Geological Survey, now Geological Service, he mapped the United States, not so much yet to manage it, 
but to manage what we knew about it that would in time obviously play into how we would manage it. Um, but this construction, I actually find however, no, however um, outdated it is to be breathtaking, just to sit in your office and actually tromp around the, the, the United States as he did, which is how he came to understand and know Gifford Pinchot among many, many other scientists who are also roaming across the United States, try to come to understanding with its, let's call it natural resources, but it's really its flora and fauna uh, and its geography. Um, it, is, it is a remarkable initiative that he developed, but that's not all he wanted to do because to understand a life zone meant that you had to figure out what was in that life zone and what made that life zone different from other life zones so that you could map it in the ways that he does with the swoops and the curls and the, and the different colorings. Uh, again, um, it may be too mappy um, and, and seem too precise when we know full well the holes that actually lie in these spaces. But what the life zone conception led Miriam to do was to argue that to figure this out, we needed to do surveys and we needed to do an entire survey of the United States. He never managed to do that in part because Congress never gave him the money to do it. But what he could do, he could start to map um, a kind of national rationalization um, of the biota of the United States. And so as a way to think this out, one of the things that I've been working on um, is the biological survey in Texas uh, that would ultimately be published in 1905 because I'm working on William L. Bray and you'll see him in a moment. Um, and it was through Bray that I came upon the biological survey and that, that survey then led me back to what the broader um, initiative was on the part of Miriam. Um, and part of why Miriam wanted to study Texas and his map here doesn't do justice to the remarkable um, economic problems and, and geographical diversity of that stage. But he rationalized it to Congress, which would give him the money to do it because Texas was a major agricultural state at the time by saying, you know, there are a lot of economic problems in the state. The range was being depleted, actually was largely de depleted by the time he pled for money. Uh, Longhorns, cattle, sheep, and goat um, are pretty uh, efficient lawnmowers, and they had basically wiped out much of the grasslands. So to understand that, he argued, we need to go in and assess what's going on. Um, there was large predation, at least as the ranchers claimed, on their livestock. And so therefore, Miriam could say, look, we've got to figure this piece, this other piece out. Um, and then because he, he was really interested in taxonomy um, and, and the distribution of species across the landscape, those were, he said very cleverly, key to understanding solutions that might be devised for the agricultural challenges that Texas and a lot of other states uh, were enduring in the late 19th century. Well, Miriam isn't gonna do this work. And here's the other thing about this early stage. He had the big picture. He understood why Texas should be crucial to this process, but he needed foot soldiers. He needed to be able to send people to do this work. And what's really interesting um, is the informal, almost voluntary uh, nature of the crew that would sweep through Texas to do this work. Um, the key figure in this is a guy by the name of Vernon Bailey. Um, here on the left, a intriguing photograph, another mustache, nice tie, um, and a really formal face that you'll see in a moment is not like that when he's out in the field. But one of the things that, that, that Bailey will do for Miriam, and Miriam, he's getting paid 40 bucks a month initially. Miriam is giving him out of his own pocket another 10 so that he could actually do some of the work. Um, but what Bailey will organize in, um, let's call them excavations, they're really expeditions of some form. Um, there will be 10 men, all men, field agents, most of whom actually don't work for the biological survey, like William L. Bray, they, they attach themselves at various points um, and produce pretty remarkable reports that then Bailey will um, um, annotate and develop and, and turn out into what will ultimately be the final publication, the biological survey of Texas. Um, but note the map on the right. 
Um, it's a little tilted. I grabbed it earlier today, um, but it's an intriguing marker of the 200 sites that these 12 men, beginning in the late 1890s and uh, running up uh, in the middle 18, early and middle 1890s, running up uh, until 1905. Bailey was repeatedly down in the state. These other figures were moving in and, and um, collaborating with him at different times, um, but they really mapped the different ecological and economic zones in a sense. Uh, for those of you who know, Texas Seven is basically the Edwards Plateau. Uh, the Gulf Coast, as you can see, where Aransas uh, National Wildlife Refuge and others are. Uh, the Piney Woods are in one. Um, and and running up through the center of the state, nine, eight, seven, uh, and and six is really the Great Plains and their and their various movements through here. What Bailey learned from Miriam, and what those who were here did was, you didn't just go in and look around. You had to do precise, which is why they have the sites. You have to do precise investigations of particular places, collect plants and animals. Um, as best you're able to do, uh, which is what he does. Uh, you kept a field journal. You supplied an annual report that was based on the field journal. You took photographs, and there's more than a thousand photographs that they took in Texas alone to sort of illuminate what it is that you found in the Piney Woods or the Rolling Plains or the Cross Timbers uh, or the Trans-Pecos West, which is 10, um, out towards El Paso. Um, and those, those photographs are the few I've seen are really kind of astonishing because you can see what they're looking for and how they're thinking about this landscape, even without the, the field guides to help you do this. But Bailey knew, as did Miriam, that the, the vastness of Texas required lots of other people to come join you um, and to join in on this effort. And one of the reasons why, and this is my favorite photograph of Bailey, he looks rugged and grizzled, uh, not like that formal photograph um, on the earlier slide. But one of the things that Bailey wrote in a letter back to Miriam in 1897 was, is that as he's going through really the Edwards Plateau and West, he said, there's an ocean of plants all around that I don't know anything about and can't stop to look at. Now, keep in mind, this is millions of square acres. Uh, basically all of West Texas and the, and the Northern Panhandle because he, he's taught himself uh, about mammals and, and uh, Miriam is the ornithologist, but they're not, um, they're not botanists. And so one of the things that Bailey slash Miriam did was to look around for people who could help them. And one of the key figures in this process, although he didn't write directly for the biological survey, was J.M. Coulter. Um, and his massive tome, uh, three-volume tome, maybe 600 pages in total, um, that ultimately would be published by the National Herbarium, uh, The Botany of Western Texas. Coulter is one of the first generations of trained botanists. He's got his PhD. Um, he was president of Indiana. He would be president of Lake Forest College or then university outside of Chicago and ultimately would end up as the first professor of botany at the University of Chicago. And I tell you that process um, because it would be crucial for him to figure out um, what botany would be, not the botany that he knew, because this book is really very taxonomic in its focus. It's about plants and not the environment that sustains them. It's really about the plants themselves, absent the world that they inhabit. And it's in the middle 1890s that he and his graduate students start to read the new ecological work that's coming out of Europe. And they're totally transformed because suddenly they realize that thinking about a plant separate from the world in which it is located is a mistake. And that's sort of what, what Miriam is also arguing with life zones, but this is a different framing of that same problem. And one of Coulter's students, William L. Bray, takes this German and uh, Dan Danish ecological work and applies it to um, the Edwards Plateau, uh, the Lano Estacado and the Edwards Plateau as his dissertation under, Bre under Coulter's um, um, mentorship. And in fact, Bray studied 
with Coulter in Indiana, got his BA there in botany, moved with Coulter to uh, Lake Forest, where he got his MA and started teaching botany there. And then when Coulter moved um, to the University of Chicago, so did Bray. Um, and that's where he got his PhD um, in 1898 with a really quite remarkable class of four or five men, um, all of whom went on to have remarkable careers. All of them were ecological in their orientation, um, as was Bray. Bray was in Berlin for a year during his graduate work. Um, he sent a telegram to Coulter saying, what? Single word. Which was like, what am I going to do once this thing is done? But he just said, what? And uh, Coulter wrote back, Texas. That was his hiring, effectively. Coulter knew that there was a job at the University of Texas that was opening up. Bray became the candidate. And because his dissertation was about Texas, it seemed pretty logical that he would go to the University of Texas in Austin, which he did. And it's there that he starts to revise his dissertation to really fill in the story about the West Texas vegetation. And it's in that process that he not only meets Gifford Pinchot in Washington, who gave him a 10-year contract to be a contractor for the Forest Service, and he would produce a series of reports, including this one on the right of your screen, for that agency. But he came to the attention of Miriam and of Bailey. And in 1899, Bray applied for a sabbatical, even though such a thing was not actually offered by the University of Texas. He pitched the idea, and the president bought it, uh, rightly, um, that this would help him enhance the work of the university in terms of its botanical collection, in terms of its public service. And it's a, it's a land-grant institution at some level, although it, it, Texas A&M is actually the land-grant. Um, but that it would serve agricultural interests. The president said, absolutely go do it. Um, and so Bray spent 50 days with Bailey in 1899 and then actually got on to Bailey's entourage at different points in time, even though he's not credited uh, formally with having worked with Bailey after the 1899 experience. Um, and in his sabbatical report, which I happened to find at the University of Texas, you know, sometimes these things happen. Um, among the things that he argued um, why this worked, the first of which is he brought back 500 specimens of plants for an herbarium that didn't exist at the University of Texas. He created that um, because not only because they were carefully selected, but he's going to use them in his classroom. So this is a direct concept. Research is moving into the classroom rapidly in his concept of it. It would give botany a new overview and a new way of thinking about its role in the state. Uh, for him, botany and the state were intertwined in a ways that they were also for Miriam and Bailey. But no less, as with Miriam and Bailey, was he also thinking about the dynamic of um, resource exploitation and what it was doing. And so the bottom quote uh, from his is about the condition of the grasses and other forage plants. Um, these photographs from the Texas um, Edwards Plateau report that he wrote for the Forest Service are also talking about watersheds. One of the things that Bray is really good at is looking not just at land cover, but thinking about water flowing off of that land cover and what happens. Um, and so he learned a lot on the pro in the process of working for um, Bailey in that 50-day period. They crisscrossed the state in that 50-day period partly on horses, partly on train and, and whatever, and, buck, and, and, and carriages, uh, wagons really, as they wove their way across the state, mapping and um, taking the notion of the survey and learning how to do the survey in terms of how uh, the Bureau wanted it done. And from Bailey's point of view, this was great because he didn't know plants and B Bray did. From Bray's point of view, this is an extraordinary opportunity that gave him a leg up at the University of Texas. He was a very fast flyer up the tenure ladder. Um, and this was one of the ways by which he managed that process. Um, and I think part of it is also here we see the interplay between working for the biological survey and coming away with information that he would use to write two reports, actually three, only two were published though, for the Forest Service. So what he did for one agency ultimately bore uh, fruit for the other, but then you read um, the work that that um, 
Bray would ultimately produce the massive biological survey of Texas, and he gives uh, Bray credit, rightly, uh, for having a huge impact on um, his understanding and also in, in, in the work that he was doing. So part of what we're thinking about then is the way in which this process unfolded for both men that tells us something about the interplay between agencies, between the academic world and the agency world. And that moderates the conception, at least early on, that these agencies were simply top-down managers. They depended upon the expertise of professionals, in this case of Bray and Coulter and others. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind as as we think about the administrative state, it turns out the administrative state um, was not as robust as imagined. I mean, Pinchot's world was never quite as top down um, as it's often argued to have been. And I think part of what that means is that we need to be rethinking these early years and the way in which um, these interconnections inside and outside um, Washington um, played out. And so this biological survey and all of the credit that goes to Bray and a host of other basically ad hoc field agents made it was possible for us to have Northern American Fauna number 25 published in 1905, which is about to be republished. Um, David Smedley, Smidley, um of Oklahoma State um, who worked on this survey years ago is now about to bring out another version. And what Smidley says, and I, and I love his way of thinking about it, is that this project that Miriam and others was involved, were involved in serves as the baseline for all research now if we want to do longitudinal studies. And you can see that in scholarly article after scholarly article, everybody starts with Bailey at least if you're writing about Texas and in other states where he also did this. And that's really crucial in part because climate change is forcing us to think more longitudinally and also prospectively, like what's gonna happen as Texas warms up, as Texas is warming up, uh, an issue that is of considerable concern in California and elsewhere in the Southwest to be sure. You go back to these earlier analyses um, as the sort of modern nation is emerging and you can see what the changes have been and how they, how they unfold. That's really crucial on the one hand, um, but it's also a sign, it seems to me, that, that um, with Bailey's report five years later, Miriam resigns out of, let's call it disgust with Congress's unwillingness to continue to fund this work at the level that he thinks it does. And with his resignation, the first chapter in the history of what would become Fish and Wildlife Service um, closes. Um, and while the survey would remain in the name of the agency for the next three decades, its work was beginning to shift to resource management, to the refuges themselves, to predator control, maybe not the happiest of, of opportunities that the uh, Bureau took on. Um, but even as that new chapter emerges and people like Ding Darling will come in and do such remarkable work uh, for the biological survey, some things never changed. Um, and I have to close with this wonderful um, cartoon that J. Ding Darling put in a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt, arguing in, on behalf of his budget. Um, when he got the news from Rex Tugford, Tugwell, one of FDR's right-hand men, um, that his budget was going to be slashed. And here he was advancing the notion of refuges, advancing the mission of the agency. And Roosevelt, like every other president, sort of would look at that and go, well, they could lose four million bucks. Um, and you know, if, if, if doing more with less was true for Miriam, as true for Ding Darling, um, that's a story I suspect y'all know very, very well. Um, and at that point, I should say thank you so, so much uh, for giving me the chance to talk with you today um, and to talk with you about your agency. Thanks, Char. That was amazing. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it really helps us to have outside views on the agency. And, 
the last point you made actually had never occurred to me, even though I've been the agency historian for 22 years <laughs> about the, the biological survey name. And it raises the question, yeah. the, I, the life zone maps, this, this, uh, this passion to survey, where is this coming from? I mean, is, is Miriam being taught this in school or is this part of the post civil war <laughs> nation building where do you where do you think this yeah drive is i actually you know there's obviously a, a a sort of personal notion that drives this i mean he is a self-taught ornithologist he spent a lot of time thinking about it he organized the american ornithological union it's from that platform that they argued that there should be a federal bureau, which by the way, people who are interested in forests are doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. Um, and it's all amateurs that go into the, what would become the forest service as it will be with, with Miriam. Um, so on the one hand, because he's not a professional, he doesn't feel himself to be blinkered. Like I can only think about this subject. I'm thinking about everything, right? But it also is, I mean, think about John Wesley Powell, you know, roaring down the Colorado River. Um, I mean, these guys were bold and maybe a little too bold in, in terms of Powell's sense. I mean, they wanted to map everything. And if you were a geologist, you, you had to get out there and hammer stuff and, and sort of build this larger collection. And I do think, I mean, and your point is well taken with the, with, uh, the post-Civil War expansion and the Indian Wars that are devastating indigenous people. Well, once you wipe them out or put them on reservations, the same term that we use to describe a forest reservation, the same word we use to describe a bird reservation, people, animals, and trees are being reserved. Um, and so, um, and especially in, in the case of the indigenous people, those reserves kept shrinking. Um, and so if that's the case, A, you've just wiped out that traditional knowledge, or at least our willingness to listen to that traditional knowledge. And so you have to build new knowledge. And I think it's in the building of knowledge that what is what Miriam is really about. That's what the life zones are. It's like, I've got an infrastructure of information that I want to convey in a brilliant map. Uh, I mean, anthropologists have a field day with these sort of infrastructure of and networks of information. Um, and I think historians need to pay more attention to it because, because the way in which these settler colonial constructs of I'm going to do life zones. I'm not going to talk to anybody who's actually lived here for millennia. I'm going to reconstruct them um, as best I can. And so that's what, I mean, the concept of survey really plays into that. We are going to survey the land um, and, and um, you know, as best they could do, they did a good job. Um, and it is, you know, in the end, the, the sort of um, gift that they give us is that we can use that to figure out the world now. That, that raises an interesting question, and this might be beyond your current examination of Bray and these guys, but do any of these uh, early naturalists use indigenous knowledge? Do any of them reach out to, to any Native Americans or, or you know, do they dismiss it? Yeah, that's, it, it really not. Um, although I know when, when Bray was in graduate school, he wrote a book review. There was a journal that Coulter had started called the Botanical Gazette, which was the leading journal uh, botanically in the United States. And Bray wrote a book review about an ethnobotanist having wrote, written a book about indigenous knowledge. And he's clearly intrigued by it, right? He took the assignment to write about it. Um, but then you see no use of that conception. And so when they're roaming across West Texas, um, they're in East Texas Piney Woods, there's no conversation going on. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I think because they thought they were inventing knowledge, why would you go ask somebody? They do ask ranchers, they do ask uh, lumber companies, they do speak to those on the ground. So they're not just deriving expertise based on their own knowledge. Um, but but in Texas in particular, the indigenous people were pretty well pummeled um, and there weren't many reservations and what was left was, was in, in ways that was true in California also. Um, they should have. I mean, like that would have been my implication is like there are a lot of people around here who know a hell of a lot more than I do. Maybe I should talk to them. Um, but I think they were also charged by the, the idea. There's an adrenaline rush that I'm going to Texas and I'm going to find out what's there.
pretty imperial and pretty ambitious what? and you know re retrospect pretty um uh funny and narrow <laughs> it's like yeah. and myopic <laughs> sure. yeah i want the past to be like me which would help me be less narrow um but you know something like that well, another interesting thing that comes out when i see the picture of of bailey and the images of him and Miriam, uh, and basically the leadership in places like Death Valley, uh, yes, and even Spencer Baird is how the the heads of these agencies, and maybe it was the same for Gifford Pinchot, spend a lot more time in the field <laughs> yeah. than they do yeah, starting in the '30s and so on. And and no, yeah. is that just everybody does that, or was it felt like? you know you you had to maintain your credentials as a field naturalist i mean they are in the field a lot um they are in the field a lot and i would say that i mean one of the things the forest service did was to shut down in the summer which like who wanted to be in washington dc without air conditioning um as you well know um and sent everybody out into the field and i think some of that is street cred right you want to show up mm -hmm. and, and and meet with rangers or or whatever, or you want to do real field work um, in the time that's allotted to you. But it's also a reflection that the agencies, as they are emerging, um, are more flexible about like the Washington office, as they, the WO, as the Forest Service calls it. Um, now is this thing separate and apart? And I noticed on the Fish and Wildlife Services map. It's its own region, um, right? That that it that kind of separation doesn't happen um, for the Forest Service. It started in the twenties, where it becomes much more top down um, and much more bureaucratic, and and so that's how you know when a startup has become not a startup. I would say fish and wildlife happened probably in the nineteen thirties when more refuges came in. Um, mm -hmm. That's Problem. That's really true of the Park Service, which was pretty uh, thin on the ground until the 1930s and the Roosevelt sort of compiling, you know, the Ickes just went after everything that wasn't nailed down by anybody else and then went after those two um, as best he could. So I would say that's sort of the moment when the administrative state, we call it the welfare state at some level, but I think it's really more administrative, um, starts to really get its feet under it. And that means that the chief, whatever the name or title is, director, um, that person's job is less outside of Washington and much more to do with Congress and, and you know, um, get, getting money. And as I mentioned yesterday, you know, one of the things that I think defined Miriam's um, challenges was not just that Congress was tight fisted, that he didn't figure out a way to release that fist. Pinchot did. Stephen Mather and the Park Service did. They got money. Every time they got more land, they got more money. And so they had figured out something that I think Miriam did not. Um, and that may be personality. It may be um, that he just didn't like playing politics, where Stephen Mather and Pinchot loved playing politics. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think that sort of delayed the emergence of the biological survey as a real powerhouse um and and but it came into its own obviously it's interesting um you showed that one darling cartoon well you showed two uh darling yeah. cartoons and he he was very good at raising funds in spite of that last cartoon you showed <laughs> during his yeah. brief tenure but he too hated it and one of his cartoons shows him why he left dc uh, it's actually one we have in the archives, and it was it's an original, but it's it's the constant circle of lobbying, asking for money, being denied, tin yeah. cupping, basically. Right. And right. he just couldn't yeah. keep doing that. He did not enjoy that, although he was good at it. And one gets the impression yeah. Miriam did not enjoy it and was not good at it. <laughs> yeah, I think Either. that's fair. So, like, it was the worst. Yeah, but, but what Dean Darling also did is, I mean, he he went out and collaborated with people outside the federal government. Yeah. Right, you know, duck stamps and other kinds of things that help states and the like. Yeah, uh, that's really smart. That is so smart um, because if Congress isn't going to get you what you want, then you, you you go outside and get some funding that makes Congress go, oh, okay, let's let's open up sure. the the coffers just a bit. There's a question. Ben Roberts, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
Right. Yeah, there's about you got two. The, the first question, Char, was where in Europe were the main influences coming from? You alluded to that that these scientists yeah. were were yeah. influenced by European naturalists. Who who where was uh, this coming mostly from? Mostly Germany. Mostly Germany and absolutely every profession in the United States. Uh, you know, as an historian, that's where history as a profession emerged and where where graduate programs, Berlin and other places were churning. I mean, Americans were flocking there. Um, so were social workers or what would become social workers. So were botanists. So were biologists. Uh, in part, before the University of Chicago, you know, basically what Chicago did um, was to become the epicenter of biological study in the United States. But that's why Bray went to Germany for a year and came back um, having done that, which gave him a credibility that that he wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, so much of the ideas, this is, you know, the sort of professionalization of knowledge um, and the departments that I suspect everybody in this talk was an undergraduate in. That profession was created between the 1870s and the 1920s. And That's every university. Point. Went, yeah. Yeah. No, but it's really I do that about. I do it about forestry from your book and Pinchot and, and his influences. But in our agency, Spencer Baird and the old Fish Commission, uh, Germany yeah. was the place for aquaculture, which was in part the reason for Baird's failed experiment with carp, <laughs> which is very popular in Germany. <laughs> turned out not to be a popular delicacy in, in America at all. <laughs> and yet yeah. he, he yeah. helped stock it all over. We, let me, we have a couple yeah, more well, questions. Yeah. Marilee. Wanted to know that uh, she pointed out that John Wesley Powell studied the languages yep. of indigenous peoples uh, and wondered if, if you knew anything about him collecting environmental knowledge at, at the same time from them. Might be a yeah, Don Worcester a, question. <laughs> it is a question for Don Worcester, who's probably not on this call. He wrote but, a book on Powell. I would know. You know, I, I, there is an interplay between Powell and the Paiute and others. Um, and it would be interesting. And I've got to go back and look at Don Worcester's book. Um, but, you know, and also with fire management, um, he, you know, in many ways may have been in advance of others about fire management in the United States, um, in part because of the work he did in the West. Um, but it's also true that he was a busy mapper. And if you read his Aaron, Arid Lands report from the 1870s, uh, it looks exactly like Miriam's, except he's talking about geography and geology. Um, and so whatever he may have learned, it, you know, it's hard to distinguish his text from other people's text in other agencies, which tells us a lot about the sort of imperializing of the West. Um, or, you know, it, it, was, it was a conquest on so many levels, including scientific. Absolutely. And for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with it, one of our colleagues, Donald Worcester, who's also given public lectures out here, he wrote a beautiful book on John Wesley Powell called The River Running West, uh, A Life of John Wesley Powell. Uh, another one of our colleagues, Jamie Lewis from the Forest History Society, has a question that was burning in the back of my mind, too, about any parallels or, or uh, between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service uh, in their battles with Congress over budgets. Yeah, I, I <laughs> you know, um, what Pinchot promised was that with the national forest, he could make them pay. He never delivered on that. No one has ever delivered on it. It's like low cost. It's, uh, 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 it's, 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 it's a joke, but it's a really good rhetorical move. Um, and in a way he was able to get the funding, but, and here's an example. Um, so it, once Roosevelt starts denoting bird reservations without really checking, right, he's just doing it and it's going to go to the biological survey, um, and he doesn't control the budget. So Miriam's going like, where's the money? Like, how am I going to do this? So if you look at that, um, the Audubon Society paid the salary of the guy at Pelican Bay, whose name I'm blanking on. It starts with a K. Kroger Paul Craigle. Like Paul Craigle. Craigle. Right. So the Audubon yeah. Society that paid for the first custodian of Pelican Bay because the federal government can't be bothered. 
while Roosevelt is doing that, he's denoting lots of national monuments, some that will go to the Biological Survey, uh, some which will go inside the Forest Service, not a penny more. Congress doesn't give it more. And Pinchot wrote a letter to the rangers in Arizona and elsewhere and said, OK, like this has just now been added to our inventory and therefore to your work, but you only go there when it's convenient. So they put up warning signs, as Hal Rothman said. It's sort of warning, what do you call it? Warning sign preservation. You put up a sign, but you don't manage because you don't have the bodies to manage. I mean, these rangers are trying to manage a million acres. Like They can't even manage that. And then Roosevelt goes, how about a national monument? You could use that. And so, Jamie, I think your question is a great one. And it's, it's a really interesting way in which the resource preceded the budget that you could use to manage that resource. Um, and I don't think it's really until the 1930s, for example, that the Park Service recovered, right? They just got whacked with all of these parks, but they don't have the budget to actually manage them. That's something that Harold Dickey's uh, was able and more able to do because, boy, he could go to Congress and get whatever he wanted. I don't know how he, I mean, you know, he had a Democratic Congress and so he could do that. Um, but that's a good question because I suspect other agencies um, were similarly strapped. Um, <laughs> I mean, thank you for the Grand Canyon, but like, can we have some money to do the work that you're saying we're gonna do? Um, and that didn't always happen. I got one last question because we're just about sure. out of time, but you, you did a great job in your Pincho work showing his role in the conservation movement. Um, mm -hmm. Everything from popularizing the term to professionalizing the, the staff. What is the biological survey's role in the American conservation movement? It, almost certainly it's different than Pinchot and the Forest Service. And I just, I want to end with a hard one. Sorry, Char. <laughs> yeah, no. Like, that assumes I know what I'm talking about, which, by the way, folks, I, 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 I will acknowledge my ignorance. Um, I think the, I think it's easier to answer that now than it would have been then that, um, you know, part of what Miriam was trying to do was this big intellectual and ambitious agenda, which he didn't fully achieve. Um, what the agency would morph towards after he was gone is predator control and refuge uh, management. And the budget sort of moved in that direction. Um, you know, predator control is is not really conservation, but but in truth, you know, if you're going to talk about the economic role that a biological survey can play, if it's like going to identify that you know mountain lions or whatever are eating livestock, then you go after the mountain lions. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's not what we would do today, I suspect. Um, but it's really the refuges that I think become. Um, and again, you guys know way better than I, but from the outside, I would say it's the refuges that most um, embody uh, two things. One of which is a uh, protectionist position um, relative to the resource. So whether it's Pelican Bay or Arctic National Wildlife Refuge or whatever it is, uh, the goal is um, to preserve that space as best as one's able to, um, even though knowing it's in a context that like oil, say, um, is going to potentially complicate that process. And secondly, the management isn't just about protecting, it's, it's deeply embedded in the science of ecology um, and, and recognizing that all of these spaces have multiple biomes and multiple ecosystems in ways that, that Miriam didn't know. Um, and I don't blame him for that. It's just a different way of organizing knowledge. Um, and so I would say that. Um, that plus thirdly, recreation, and, and you can tell me more about sort of the recreational impulse and the numbers that come to these refuges, um, which, you know, I suspect is large, um, but, but I think that's part of an answer. The other part of the answer is it is where I started, which is Fish and Wildlife plus Park Service plus BLM plus Forest Service, and then if you want the marine sanctuaries, throw in NOAA. Um, as a constellation now, they're essentially doing much the same work. Protecting, having recreation, and whether their budgets are up or down, and in 
mostly down, uh, given the vastness of the space they're asked to, to manage. Um, you do what you can do as best you can, but you know the Forest Service isn't cutting anything like the timber it cut 40 years ago. Um, and so the big driver of its economic connection with the communities is recreation. Um, and that's probably true. For, I mean, I know it's true for Park Service. It's probably true with the exception of minerals, perhaps with BLM. Um, and I think there's like this more a greater convergence of mission, even if it's articulated differently. In the end, the outcome is the same. And so, you know, I would I would say that um, Fish and Wildlife and the Park Service have really sort of been the pioneers in trying to figure out how do you protect landscapes from getting overrun by human beings, but also doing the science that's absolutely essential for us to understand um, how Yosemite functions in a, in a broad sense or even in a narrow sense. Um, and the commodity agencies, the Forest Service and BLM in particular, um, have moved in that direction. And so there's a really, you know, Jamie asked the question about budgets. I think we can also look at sort of mission outcomes um, as another way to think about this process, uh, which is why I'm totally fascinated by federal land management agencies. <laughs> we can tell your passion came through. This is a wonderful talk. I can't think of a Thank more you. appropriate one for unearthing, you know, a relatively unknown part of our history. A lot of people know Darlene and Rachel Carson. Everything happens from the 30s yeah. on. But the biological yeah. survey is much less remembered. Uh, we are definitely want to have you back when West Side Rising comes out. Uh, I'm yeah. very curious Love to push back the uh, environmental justice movement to the 1920s, especially with the Latino uh, influence. I think this will be this will be something that will be new to our audience also. So thank you, Char. And I'd like to very much sure. thank all of you who took the time to, to tune in, either in the morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I think this was a great uh, start to our, our sesquicentennial celebration. So thank you all. Thank you.